My name is Momo, and I've been trying to quit music for over 20 years until a dentist from New Jersey with a crazy instrument company made me think otherwise. It has always been about inspiration, the right person, that right thing, or that person that provides that perfect thing that gives you your thing, as well as it being the very last thing you would ever expect to have it. In my case, I met a man only once in 1997 at a music show in LA, and I was going to have to wait 20 years for his creative madness and friendship to start taking effect. And I'm not the only one. I reached out to a bunch of awesome individuals who were all there for the ride from the very beginning, and they all shared their thoughts and experiences about the inventor of the Space Ranger guitar. The impact was huge, and so was the bottom horn of the guitar and the bass that starred in the Austin Powers Gold Member movie. Love it? Hate it? You're gonna talk about it, and once you play it, you'll understand it. It's all about having fun and triggering your creativity into uncharted territories. And that's what this man did for me and so many others. Now sit back, relax, and welcome to my film, My Friend Matt. I first met Matt in high school at a baseball team tryout. We had a band and Matt came around and he started on the drums. He developed uh, a Rolling Stones cover band that was from 1980 to 1990. And then from 90 to 97, the beginning of the company, and he drew a guitar for me one day. I said, Matt, you can't make this guitar. You have to redraw it. He says, no, no, I'm making that guitar. So that was the, you know, the first guitar with the weird shape and the first NAMM show. People walked by, they hated it or they loved it. I have a very soft spot for Matt uh, in general because I met Matt very early on in my career at Guitar Worlds. Anytime when you start something new, you're, you're kind of green. Matt was always one of the very early guys that made me feel welcome was very kind to me and very supportive. And that's an important thing. It's sort of like when you feel that you have the support of people in your industry, it gives you the confidence to do your job. These are angels of your industry. We connected when the guitars came out. And dealt with them a lot up through till uh, we shut down the magazine in 2008. He had so much energy, but also the nerve to put those guitars out when he did. You know, it was like smacking the whole guitar uh, industry in the face with these things. And I remember the first show, the Fender booth had a yellow tape around. You're a typical Matt. Matt picks up the tape and he walks under it like he owns the place. I said, Matt, we can't go in there, there's yellow tape here. So we're now we're in with talking to the Fender executives. And that was Matt's uh, enthusiasm and energy and boldness for, he carried that through his whole company, as you know. His personality is infectious, you know? He comes into the room, he lights it up. It's his enthusiasm is so infectious that you sort of, you're drawn into the things he wants you to understand about what he does. And, and I'm like, I'm on board. Matt did things that you would look at and be like, that was September. The NAMM show is in January. January went to the NAMM show. We had 16 prototypes at that NAMM show. That first show when we were in the basement, when we met you, we didn't know what to expect. It was like us little people being thrown into a fish tank. I used to go out to the NAMM show, and after like the second or third one, I'm like, I don't ever want to do this again. It's chaos. We started sending out our, our salesman. He comes back with the pictures from the NAMM show. And there's that music box. That guitar was the cover for that NAMM roundup. I thought it was great. Got in touch with Matt, and um, yeah, I don't have to tell you what it's like when you first start talking to him. <laughs> it's quite a treat. We would show up at a parade, and we would say to the police, you know, we're, we're playing over there, and they would start moving the barricades, and we would plug into the circle where no band was scheduled to play. And we'd be playing, like, on a parade day. You know, that was that. And there's Matt coming with his music box. It's a ball hit out to left field and like in positive it bounces off the rafters and somehow you catch it. You're just like, this is something new and cool. The magazine did a show on Long Island every year. Scott Turner was a giant collector. Call Scott and go, can you send me up, you know, a couple of million dollars worth of guitars? We would bring, you know, some high-end Angelicos and split head stock explorers and Super 400s. And then of course there's the music box sitting next to the, you know, half a million dollar Angelico. Well, growing up, we had guitars all over my house. So just picture walking into my house and walking up the stairs, there's guitars 
all on the walls of the staircase, in the living room, in the den, in the basement, all over. As a kid, me and my siblings used to think that it was totally normal to have guitars hanging on your walls. <laughs> and we would go to our friends' houses and we'd be like, wait, where are all your guitars that are hanging on your walls? Like, why don't you have any? He got the guitars in the Austin Powers movie. So he gets a call from the management of a, a guitar company, one of the top companies, and they said to him, how'd you do that? So hard to get your guitar from a movie. Because it was different, unique, and it fit the movie that was 60s style, was perfect. But I think what's amazing is at the time when, when I sent you pictures, you guys didn't realize that you'd been 20 years before. That was the most mind-blowing thing. I remember you telling me that. Yeah, it was like, it was like, it was like, holy shit. Man. That is insane. Imagine having met someone 20 years earlier and winding up having them in your life for like about six or seven years where you forget that you met them 20 years earlier. You have this great relationship with this guy. The guy becomes like your brother, like your family, your advisor. Then Jeff figures it out. He calls up Matt and he says, man, I think you guys actually met before. Check this out. <laughs> And then the flashbacks began flooding in and we remembered it all. That, my friends, is the proof that you never know how an encounter in your past was going to become one of the most important and pivotal encounters for your future that you just didn't know about yet. Matt and Music Vox would become the reason that I wouldn't have quit music. I was really going to hang it up after so many years of chasing my artistic dream from every single angle. I feel extremely grateful and proud to call Matt the brother that I've never had, that started off with Music Vox but went so much further. 1997 was the year that ignited that friendship, and we would have to wait for another 20 years worth of our personal extra experiences for us to become ready for each other. Now, let me introduce you to some super cool individuals and their experience on how they heard of my friend Matt in the late 90s. My first memory of Music Box was on the tour bus with the New Radicals. I think it was in the late 90s, maybe 99 or 2000. Probably the same as everyone else. Austin Powers, I think we all saw. Those bizarre looking guitars and just everyone was like, what's that? <laughs> what is that? I first heard about Music Box guitars and Matt Steichen. From a guy named Stuart Johnson, who became the drummer in Ming T. He was in the first movie with us. Somehow Stuart had a couple of these guitars. One day I'm sitting on the bus and I look over at the guitar player, Brad Fernquist, and he's got this crazy looking guitar. And I'm like, where in the world did you get that thing? And he says it came from Jim, the keyboard player. So I said, Jim, where in the world did you get that, that guitar? And he says, my dentist made it. <laughs> he came over, he had a, a space cadet. The gold sparkle space cadet that I never gave back to him. They had this crazy, amazing design to them that seemed really well suited toward the Austin Powers idea, the idea of what he was like. He's all horny all the time, you know. Susanna Hoff fell in love with it. Mike fell in love with it. Chris Ward, the other guitar player, fell in love with it. And then next thing you know, we're in contact with Matt. And Matt is providing the guitars to Matthew and the rest of the guitars for the movie. So I went to Mike Myers and brought it up to him, showed him the guitars. He thought they were great. You know, everybody did. The movie was made for people like uh, who grew up in that certain era. I think Mike Myers and I are pretty much the exact same age. So we grew up watching spy movies, so I even went to see that movie on the day it came out. Before the phenomenon even started, I knew it was gonna be a good movie, and then there was uh, some cool guitars in there too. It was at NAMM. It, it was at the NAMM show, probably 96, 97. Just cruising through with my brother and seeing the Space Ranger. Plain and simple. Phallic, Rudy's bass on Fat Albert. Crazy thing. We both just were like, what is that? It's actually in my uh, previous band before Polyphonic Spree, Tripping Daisy, yeah, 1996 or 97. I had picked up a copy of Bass Player magazine and I saw the Music Box Space 
ranger base it didn't have a very good review in the magazine and to be honest i wasn't like thrown off by that i was actually immediately attracted to it for that <laughs> very reason for me everyone in the 90s was playing fenders and gibsons that still rings true to this day but to me i've never really found like a boutique guitar that wasn't shaped like a Stratocaster, a Telecaster, or a Les Paul. It's like McDonald's Chicken McNuggets. There's like three shapes that you get. This is great. This is like a model after, you know, some kind of like Harmony or Dan Electro style kind of short scale bass, and I want to play it. I'm not a five string modulus, babinga wood kind of <laughs> bass player guy, you know? <laughs> Sorry, it uh, started on the internet. But a little before, I had bought a high-end, very expensive guitar from a guy I met in a bar. He told me it was a custom shop guitar. Relic? By a relic guru, the Einstein of relicking. Before Music Box, my relationship with guitars was just very distant. It was like, Corporation made this guitar for me, this Gibson, this Fender. This was the first time I actually had a relationship with an individual, Matt. It changed my, the way I played, you're right. It changed my desire to support this instrument and put it in projects. I took it to rehearsal. Wasn't really what I expected, so I was a little sad. Afterwards, we went to the bar. Yeah. We had a smoke, let's say. Yeah some high-end Lebanese stuff. Basically been heard in millions of households around the world in Nickelodeon cartoons or Disney cartoons. And who would know it, you know, but it's uh, it's exciting that I feel very proud that I've been able to put this in different things and music videos because I love the way it looks, love the way it plays. The next thing I remember, I had a vision. It was like a dream. Jesus himself was my roadie. Jesus told me you should look out for music fox. Guitars. I never ever heard of Music Fox guitars, so the next day I googled it and the first thing I saw on the Music Fox website was this. It looks insane. It's a work of art. It's got this horrific tumor coming out of it. You know, everything beautiful was once ugly, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people see this and they're horrified. But to me, when I saw this the first time, I said, I came to music by way of surrealism and absurdity and Salvador Dali and Picasso and these sort of things. This stood out right away because it is a piece of surrealist art. Nobody would do this to a guitar. They would be embarrassed to produce something like this out of Fender or, or you know, or Gibson, you know, but this thing, you know, it's fucking gorgeous. At the moment I had this guitar in my hand, all these voicings, all these chords that I, that have these real strange names, I could play them easily. So it was like a miracle. So basically, this is also a jazz guitar. I had seen them in the Austin Powers movies, you know, because that's, that's the movie I grew up on. I mean, if I were to watch the movie, I could probably do like the lines verbatim. That's my generation. It must have been 98, 99, something like that. It was at the NAMM show, North American Music Merchants. As far as you can see, there's guitars, hundreds of thousands of people, literally. And I thought, what is that? It looked like hockey sticks. When I went to our first trade show with the company to NAMM back in 2013, the booth was right next to Music Fox's booth. And maybe on like the second uh, or third day, I just kind of like wandered over there, met Matt, and he offered to let me try out one of his guitars, the Space Cadet, the six string, solid body. And I plugged it into the amp. It felt super comfortable. It was like one of the easiest guitars I'd ever played. I said, Lars, come on me, come on me, come on me. Put this hat on. I said, it's a bit like a space helmet. He said, that's all right. Put this hat on, Lars. I said, okay. And I put this white overalls on. I said, what we, what's this about, Matt? He said, follow me. So we go down through the aisles of the NAM, and he's got a whistle. Blowing this whistle. The Space Rangers come in, the Space Rangers come in, and all these big brands are going. We wonder long for the authorities come this is like the better stuff all this. But he made his point. Well, some years ago, again, like yourself, I, I saw, I think it must have been in Guitar Player Magazine. I've got a collection of all kinds of strange and wonderful guitars. I have a Les Paul, and I have a Stratocaster, and I have a Gretsch. Some of the orthodox guitars. 
but the biggest part of my collection is things that, that step outside the box. I mean, just from a visual point of view, they're inspiring. They make me approach something in a different way. The way they look and when you hold them, the way it makes you feel, brings a different mental process on. It was that that, that attracted me to them. Started working with him when I was 16. He had a uh, set up in his house similar to yours with all the old Dan Electros, all the Sears stuff. And I was just a young marketing guy. And so I started hustling for him and learning a lot from him from the beginning. Damn boy. <laughs> It was a guitar magazine article on it. I first saw it, and at the time, I was collecting cheap old Tisco Del Rey guitars. And then Music Vox came out. Nobody else gets it. They get it. Music Vox is Matt Eichen, and Matt Eichen is a magical person. You ever meet someone you wish they were your next-door neighbor? I used to go into the back of his, like, doctor's office and show him guitars in between surgeries. Greetings, Earthlings, we come in peace, we will not harm you. The second year we did that stunt, I did it alone and uh, I got escorted out of Nam. As I kept undressing, I had more layers of Music Vox t-shirts and so they weren't gonna kick us out of the show. We just had layer after layer of designs and branded gear. I remember calling him and saying, hey, Matt, uh, I got 12 security guards looking for me. <laughs> At the time, I was hanging out with Government Mule. I went to go see him in Philly in 96. I went up to a store in Philadelphia. They were the only ones that were carrying music boxes. It was the gold glitter, and I just didn't have the money on me at the time. And it killed me to walk out of that store without the music box. It was a Nashville NAMM show. So Matt had to compete with all those kind of people, right? They had like, you know, you had the, the Fenders, the Gibsons, the Martins. I was walking the floor, and I and there's Matt, and he's in, in he was in, like, he was totally dressed up, all right? In, in costume and I know I, I had him on my schedule to meet so when I got to his booth I'm like looking for him and I just figured this was the guy like just hired to <laughs> to stand at the booth and bring people in you know and he goes no I'm the owner I did this I'm Matt I'm like I'm like oh okay you're <laughs> About 1997, I recall. Uh, it was actually, I was at Guitar World magazine at the time. I mean, the first thing that strikes you, of course, is you're, you're taking it out of the box. And I was immediately drawn to the headstock. I discovered later on that it actually makes a lot of sense tonally. I've, I've spoken with a few players like the 70s Stratocasters because it has the larger headstock. It has more wood and it actually is better tone. Matt sent me an email. I didn't know about Music Fox at all. He said, hey, I looked at your site and you should do an article. There's this collector. And so I started doing, you know, a little bit of diligence and seeing what I could learn about Music Vox. And I thought, wait a minute, this guy Matt's story is really interesting. I called him up and I said, Matt, I'd love to do this, but I'd actually like to do it about you. It was so unusual looking. It was reminding me of like in the 60s, a lot of these really great Asian and Eastern European guitars. I love that period of time because it was so creative. We had this guitar boom going on thanks to the Beatles. It was kind of like the wild, wild west. And it was just like solid body guitar. We could just design it any way we wanted. Matt kind of took that whole ideal, that 60s, let's just go crazy with design type of thing. I was just interested in how he came to love these, what were considered at the time junk guitar that you'd buy in Sears or Montgomery Wards, and, and how that was the impetus for his exploration and how his, I guess, poverty, you'd call it, when he was in med school and, you know, sort of going to pawn shops and stuff and, you know, buying all these, what did he call it, mother of toilet seat cover guitars. He really just kind of embraced it. I watched, watched the Gold Members film, The Ming Tea Band, with Susanna Hoffs and Austin Powers. I to see Susanna Hoffs wearing this guitar is really uh, something else. She's cute, you know, anyway. And then put a cute guitar on top of her, which is really fantastic. You might have to edit this out, but we were standing on the movie set and she was pointing to that part right there. She was sort of like caressing it like this. And she's like, what's this part right here? And we were all like... <laughs> Polyphonic Spree. I saw them on TV, I thought, I recognise that Ed Stock. It, it, it stands out a mile, doesn't it? This big cashew nut, whatever you want to call it, Ed Stock. And it's just gone on from there. I just admire him so much. He's on, on the social stuff. He's got all the great names playing from now. The very first time that I became aware of Music Vox was when I saw it in an ad in a guitar player magazine. I remember like staring at it thinking, Holy shit, this is different. I think I like this. Wait a minute, I think I need one. It was like the beginning of the internet and Matt had a site that you could order them from. So I called in my girlfriend 
and I showed her the ad, asking her what she thought. So Momo and I have been together for almost four decades. As you can imagine with Momo, <laughs> I have seen every single shape, color, size, and configuration of instruments, pedals, etc., that you can imagine. There was this time where he was kind of like showing me these kind of weird, I would call them fish guitars because they look like creatures from the deep. Weird colors, weird shapes, weird extra pieces coming out of them. When he showed me the music box and I said, there's no way you're playing that, never. I think that it is so cool that Matt was one of the very first to sell his instruments on the internet and not in the stores, as well as me not buying the original Space Ranger bass, but waiting many years to wind up buying the white 12 string bass that helped separate me from the bass pack. Fast forward a few years later, he did get the 12 string bass guitar from Music Box. It just fit him so well. And of course it became part of his main arsenal. Honestly, the fact that they kind of look different makes me play different. And knowing the man that is behind this differentness and vision makes me play even harder and for the right reasons. It has to do with something that Matt infuses into each of his instruments and the passion of the design and the passion of giving musicians a tool that is, you know, imbued with creativity. Something about that connected really intensely with Momo and they developed this kind of amazing friendship. Now let me introduce some super cool 12 string bass peeps talking about their personal experiences with a 12 string bass. It's an amazing thing, every, and I just pick it up now because I want to have it on for this interview. And you just play anything. And it sounds like a song. The action is just great. It plays easy. It really is a great instrument. And you know, when I first saw them, I thought it might be a little gimmicky and it might not. I didn't know much about the company or anything, but man, these are rock solid. They don't go out of tune, dude. They, once you tune these suckers, I, I tell you, I used to see, let me see how long I can beat this thing. How many weeks <laughs> before I have to tune it? The first single I ever bought was The Birds Eight Miles High. So the, that eight-string Rickenbacker that uh, Roger McGinn played, that, that was just an iconic sound for me forever. When a guy like you's been playing for as long as you have, <laughs> you told me in the last interview you love like listening to Indian music and all kinds of stuff like that. When you go to play with you know Sons of Apollo, that doesn't necessarily come across like you're influenced by Indian music, you know, but this. This, definitely. It's a great writing instrument. It really is. Especially for a bass player. Trying to write chord change, you're playing a single note. I hear more than just a single bass note. So it really is a, an effective uh, writing tool. But I can't wait to get this on something recorded uh, properly. Just beautiful. And I've noticed that you've put your favorite little cat in the corner there. Did I? Did my eye deceive me? When they're, they, they're walking to the family, they get the spooky sticker. The rebel is the cat now, but spooky started it so we refer to her that way god rest her little kitty soul you know and i read about a couple of guys tuning them down f sharp to uh a i guess you can also do open tuning right yeah some guys do it like tune it in fifths this one is nothing but high octaves check this shit out i got i got it tuned like <laughs> that's great if you put that into your cucamonga pedal signature pedal with some compression oh yeah distortion and then you split your pickups and you keep the other one full clean with effects and reverbs and shit and you, you fucking go nuts you got to do that shit dude <laughs> more to come more to come i love how matt is basically offering instruments that you can't buy anywhere else something like 12 string bass it's really hard to to get one or eight string basses of course there's a bunch of companies making those, but uh, I think with the, the amount of different models that you can get as a 12 string, for example, for Music Box, there's no other company offering these kind of things. And this is what I really love about him, that he's not afraid to go like the, the other way. My best guess is that there are less than 5,000 12 string bases that have been built. Everybody, all over the world, every manufacturer combined over the last 40 years. So there's just not that many of us. Hey, dude, when you're playing one of those things for a while and you go pick up a four string or a five string, it's like you're playing a fucking banjo. It's a toy, right? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah. I was a hired studio guy, bass player. I brought it in. And, you know, the producer of that session, you know, looked at me like I had three heads. We're not using that. I said, well, you haven't even heard it. See, what people don't understand, they follow with animosity. <laughs> you know? Like you, I, it's become my number one instrument of all the instruments. One, two, three, bass. At first, to be honest, I thought these instruments are, are a little bit like toys because that's what often is the case with these weird shaped instruments. Many of them are not very good, but this bass really blew me away. A lot of these nice old vintage instruments are very expensive and suddenly I had this bass and it was just put a, a set of flats on it and it was perfect. I was so happy with this bass and I still am, I still own it. We're, I think, in the start of a renaissance of sorts for this instrument. All your uh, really stable products over the long term that have been big sellers have started out really small and grown gradually. They haven't been the flash in the pan, hula hoop sort of things. The big products uh, built very slowly and that's what this instrument is doing. He's contributed in, in multiple ways, not only to the design, but the manufacturing and the artist support. I mean, you know, he's good to us. He is, he is. And that's really rare. I first saw it at uh, a Nashville NAMM show. Matt was gracious enough to get me a pass to go to the show. It's a completely different experience to see them on a page and actually hold one in your hand. They become real at that point, and it's like, this is really cool. I didn't imagine that they would feel the way they did or play them the way they did. Your technique is completely different to mine in, in the sense that I use a plectrum and you're doing a lot of finger work and slapping and stuff. I find that very hard on a multiple string bass like, like that, but you have it down, so bravo to you. Here's the uh, MI-5, you know that sucker. And there's a Mellotron next to it. It's kind of the music box vibe. These instruments ask you to do something else with them. There's no single music box that sounds like a P bass or like a jazz bass or like a music man. I think music box basses are very inspiring to because they have very different sounds. I think the MI5 is currently my favorite of all of them. This is the, the, the most recent bass. This bass completely blew my mind. There are always sections in an in a, in a album or sometimes in a song where the producer says, okay, now I need something different. I need something where uh, where people, uh, what is this? Well, just you hear it and, and you, you're surprised what's happening right now. And I think uh, the MI5 does an amazing job doing that because it delivers a, a bunch of sounds that I think are very unusual and uh, I love them of a 12-string bass. Let's talk about this beast in the room. Discovering the 12-string bass coming from a four-string perspective is like jumping to a concert grand compared to a four-string bass. The thoughts can vary from very intimidating to exciting, some confusion thrown in, to are you kidding me? Does anyone need this thing? And it, it's not even a bass anymore. But I gotta tell you, that for me, it was the instrument that I had been waiting for my whole life. It opened up all these new doors, man, like for composition and arrangements, writing like accompaniment lines that you could never do without an instrument that had multiple strings. It also really helped me separate myself from the mass of bass players out there that I love. The 12-string bass, to me, is the bass that you get when you've had many other basses and you want to add some cool new tools to your musical toolbox. You can even remove some of its octaves and it automatically becomes an 8-string bass. I have a new signature bass called the Lar 80, which is kind of like an 8-string piccolo bass that really puts it into a guitar bass-like category. My friend Matt has really been generous with me on developing these Momo multiple-string instruments that really, really fits my style, as well as the Music Vox vision and design. Speaking of design and vision, why don't we go listen to some of our friends got to say when it comes to design and influence of Music Box within the instrument industry. I think design-wise, as far as the sense of humor is concerned, the playfulness and that open sort of feeling that you get when you hold one of those instruments, it really almost calls on you to connect with your inner youthful side. The other technical aspects 
are what the other companies are chasing. Getting the strings, you know, just right up and down the neck, you know, precision and things like that. Although the music box played very precisely and, and in tune and the intonation's fantastic. Some of what those companies I think are overlooking is that that inner child, that inner sort of playfulness like I'm talking about. The whole reason that we pick up an instrument in the first place. When you set a music box guitar on your lap, already it's like tickling your brain in a different way. In the 90s, retro was really just getting started. Uh, this, this idea of that the, the gear of the, the 50s and 60s was really cool stuff. It wasn't, because people had called it cheapo before then. Those were cheapo Japanese guitars or whatever. By the end of the, the 90s, it was a full-on revolution and music box, I mean, those that was right there. Here we are 20 years later, retro has never gone away in 20 years. Guitar players want P90 pickups, they want big beaver brados, they want sparkle finishes. They love all that stuff. Music Vox was there right when the, the fuse was lit. Like his very unique designs allows other companies or designers and other companies to sort of say like, you know what? I'm going to take a chance on this guitar as opposed to making the same old or just, you know, throwing a new color on a, you know, on a telly or a strap. Music Vox was, I mean, before I even knew Matt and the family and everybody, it's just like, Dude, this guy, Star Trek view, you know, sci-fi view of where guitars should, should go. He would sit and draw his designs at all hours of the night, like three, four, five in the morning, and just sit there and focus really intently until he figured out exactly which line should be drawn where. Um, and sometimes I would sit with him and it was really fun getting able, being able to see the process that his brain kind of went through as he was designing these guitars. Well, I think it might have allowed some of the retro instruments when they started reissuing Supros or airlines and things of that nature. Open the door to let those in, give the market some breadth and some depth where where it's just getting away from the Fender Gibson thing. Very few people, whether it's been a guitar or an amp or a pedal, have thought beyond that to go, well, it's not 1973 anymore. It's not 1966 anymore. We have to make instruments that inspire other people or new people, or just inspire older people who are looking for something that's, they want to add something that's not just another Strat or a Telly to their arsenal. It's a super interesting, iconic design. It, the fact that it was in the Austin Powers movies cements it, you know, in history in a way that I think really won't be forgotten because people are going to see those movies for a really long time. Matt brought Music Box back and has made such a big impact with it in this era, not just in the 90s. I think also cements his designs kind of in the minds of the guitar world. The designs that he favors and that he represents, no one else is doing. It's like if you look at cars, like if you go to Cuba, they haven't had any imports of new cars since the 50s or 60s, and everyone's just waxing their neighbor's car, and, and it's, you know, these beautiful old cars, and, and it's, you realize how beautiful their idea of the future was then. I've always loved that design. You look at a car on the road these days, and it looks like a Nike shoe. How I approach trying to modernize myself, realizing my limitations as a, as a player and conceptualist was, I was always into layering. Especially with the Space Ranger, it wasn't like you were using a Strat or a Tele. It had a little bit of a Stranger mid-range that was interesting. Just by being like the mad scientist to put the Space Ranger into stuff that sounded like horrible in a good way. And then all of a sudden you've got this complete landscape of the conventional and the bizarre, which is kind of where I've always tried to go. When we're doing the equipoise, when we were trying to figure out colors and what to do things, Matt didn't want traditionally want something different. He went to a fabric store. He came back with a bunch of rolls of fabric, the girl cloth, and coverings. And some were like really off the wall, and some were, you know, you look at it, that's, that's a dress. The one fabric he came back with these rope cloths on his camp. The light hits it, it reflects. It's not your normal, traditional thing. Having his eye and his his enthusiasm actually makes you appreciate it or it makes you see something that most people don't see off, often on the surface of it. You may like the classics, you may like the masters in art, which is like a lot of the people who play guitar. They like the traditional, the classic things. But then you have the, the Jackson Pollocks and the, and the Picassos and the Salvador Dalis of the, you know, which are just slightly off center. And, and, and there's beauty in that. 
I think Matt's designs are more like old school, not necessarily throwback, but just when design was cool and and they're they're beautiful to look at. They're beautiful instruments. You're always just like it looks like a crazy '50s taxi. Space Ranger is a classic. We have a Stratocaster, Telecaster, Les Paul, S335, Flying V, and a Space Ranger. These are the the basic electric guitar shapes. I think I like the idea that it helped me visually stand out, especially in the polyphonic spree when you have like 20 some people playing instruments and there's a lot of demand for, for your attention. There were people in the band that would flail around on stage, like trying to get their little 15 minutes of fame. And I can just sit back there and play the bass and let this bass kind of be the attention getting thing. The impact they've made, talk about uh, the Velvet Underground, like. They only had 200 fans, but everybody formed a band. I, that's how I feel about this company. Like the people that love these guitars, people like you and me, we are champions of these guitars, you know? I can't speak for the broad impact. I don't know if it's had that sort of reach, but I know what it's done for people like me or you and a few others. And that means more than all that we're talking about there. When I first became aware of that company with the amoeba shape guitars and basses and all, all those wacky colors and designs. I mean, that really stood out, right? You know, it was completely unique. When I saw that advert, the white uh, space cadet, part of it was the design that attracted me. It wasn't completely off the wall. You know, Matt was really on the edge of this. There was a time, especially in the 90s, when he came out and you had a lot of the alternative musicians, what they, they called alternative and grunge and that sort of thing. And they were kind of looking at these other things and they were looking for more personality. They weren't looking to be the typical Les Paul and Strat type of player. The more interesting, unusual guitars were coming from the 60s and manufacturers hadn't really caught on that yet. Matt kind of led the wave on that. A lot of people saw him do that and succeed, and so that, you know, created this whole wave. Well, first of all, I'll just match straight out and get good. Straight away, people are saying, what is it, what is it, what is it? Not a matter what it sounds like. And I, you know, some people are bad snobs or can't be seen with that, but it has changed. The kids might be playing a Strat or an S Paul, but it might be pink with some sparkles on it. They don't quite want one that their dad had. They want to be a little bit, and just diverse them a little bit. I think Music Box is possible, Matt himself, He's almost turned it like full circle and it's like a must-have one. I describe some of his guitars as, you know, looking like an animator for the Jetsons might have come up with it. There's very much that sensibility and again, sense of fun as well, you know, that, you know, hey, look, that guitar looks like a rocket ship. That guitar looks like it's got an appendage or an alien sort of thing going on. There's no reason for the Space Ranger to look the way it does. I mean, there's just, it doesn't have to look like that. They're almost like Moreau paintings. A weird thing I just thought about is kind of um, spiritual in a way. Matt's an oral surgeon. Matt deals with people's mouths and Matt helps people smile comfortably and he's made an instrument that makes you smile. Music Box kind of just taught me how to to use different pickups and how to how to how to hear different pickups. So many guitars with different pickups that I'd never even played or I mean I'd never even heard before. I was like let's try that one. Oh my god that one what's that what the, I don't even know what thing that is but let's plug it it's totally different than the other one so we would layer guitars for me it was very very educational to just learn how to blend distortion and learn how to layer guitars the people are looking at these guitars like people come up to them and it's very funny because like i started playing on like cruise ships when i was 19. throughout the years i had a strat i had a gibson studio les paul and I even had like a big jazz guitar too, just like one that's, you know, an arch top. In those situations, no one ever would come up to me and ask me about my instruments. They always do like the same look. They like, they turn and like, look like this, like, well, like well, what instrument is that? You know what this is, Vigili. What a brilliant video guitar that is. I mean, how better can you get with that? Hey? I'm friends with a wizard is how I feel. And they were the innovators. You know, before Eastwood Guitars, before all these other guitar companies, Reverend, it was Music Vox that started it. This is one of the original prototypes right there. Made in America, uh, nitrocellulose. This is one of the original Space Ranger prototypes. I think he had nine made, and this was the Seafoam Green. And so I did a whole article on appreciation of this one. This is 
my favorite guitar of all time. I think that all the other companies that are coming out with radical designs, all of those guys owe a big debt of gratitude to Music Fox because they brought back Pawn Shop Chic. And they had the balls to actually get these guitars made. I mean, look at this. Who would make this guitar? Who would have the balls to make this guitar, you know? When Matt brought out the MI6, I saw that in Guitar Aficionado magazine, and there was a limited edition with a sparkle finish, and I thought, I've just got to get one of those. <laughs> I bought one of those with a gold sparkle. More recently, I was looking at the, the Space Cadet, and I liked the one with the white triangle and the red body. My wife said, you don't need another guitar, you've got 70 guitars. And then, <laughs> when she wasn't looking, I ordered it. <laughs> I love the design and aesthetic of my Music Vox instruments. I also like to play this game that I play with my eight and my 12 string basses, which is to see just how long I can play and record without having to tune them. How long do you think that would be? Like a few hours, a couple of days? I'll tell you, it's more like weeks and months of beating and smashing, and surprise, surprise, it's still in tune. <laughs> It really became obvious to me that they were incredible to photograph because of their colors, their shapes. They have a design that's configured kind of like, you know, the futuristic 50s kind of mentality. So I think that Matt has a love for that time and that translates to his design. The other thing that also really fascinates me about the design is the different emotions, right, that these instruments actually evoke in people. Like when you first see it, right, you either love it or you hate it. The ones that love it, they have a very positive, open-minded nature to them and get the whole trip of playing and collecting like different types of stranger type of instruments. The ones that don't get it go from like, no, sir, I don't like it, to who the hell would do something like this, to the most violent, insulting, disgraceful comments that they say about my friend's creations that I have ever heard. And all of this without ever playing one. As well, I gotta tell you, it's burnt into their minds forever. So could this be part of the magic of Matt's design that makes you make peace with your inner conflicts and gets you back to the fun of creating music? Hmm, I would say maybe so. At least that's what it's kind of done for me. Let's go check out what kind of impressions were made on others who have become part of this artistic and musical family of amazing individuals. Matt, from the very beginning when I spoke with him, he was um, very warm. I think we were emailing each other back and forth in the early days. And we just decided to have a phone conversation one day. And the phone conversation lasted about two hours, which is a long time to talk on the phone, unless you're talking to your mom or your granny or your dad or whatever, you know. I mean, this is Matt, a guy that I've never met before. He bonded on so many things, that the music aspect of things, him being a drummer, me being a drummer. I just found him to be very open and very gentle person. Anybody that's watching the video, if they do any sort of research on Matt's journey with creating the instrument, how he's managed his company and his business, staving off the wolves all along the way and holding on to the company so that he can continue to put that type of care into it. Matt is just sort of eternally cheerful and, and upbeat. I mean, he's as much of a fan as he is a, a guy who builds guitars and creates instruments. What I try to do as a reviewer is to actually get in the mind of the person building it and sort of try and capture what their intent is. and. You know, he's responded to that. He's like, you you figured out what I'm doing. So, it, you know, it's his joy to create these instruments for me to try to, to express that in writing and just so enthusiastic about, uh, you know, the players and the gear and, and even us writers who, uh, you know, <laughs> not, not, not many people celebrate the writers, but it's nice to have a, a manufacturer say, you know, you, you really got it. You understood what we were trying to do. So that's a, that's a good feeling. I just appreciate his heart. You know, he's really in it, you know, not to make a crap load of money. He's not in it for his ego. I mean, there's still jazz when players pick up their instruments and like them. You know, there's that thing about, oh, this is awesome. He's also someone who just loves being around musicians and guitar players and bass players and doing whatever he can to give them the tools to make them have some fun. I, I mean, I'll forever 
thank him for that because, you know, there's not a, not a lot of those guys left anymore. Matt is relentless. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Relentless. There is no other guitar manufacturer that I can point to who has, and keep in mind, these guitar manufacturers have teams of marketing people, salespeople, you know, designers, everything. But Matt does it all himself. That switch nev is never off. It's always on. He's constantly pushing his brand, constantly uh, promoting his brand. And then in addition, he's still creating in his brand. To me, that's a fascinating case study. He's just always been wonderful to me, always been in touch a lot. He's the ultimate in artist relations, very personal for him. It's something he did as a hobby for himself. Just like music is something I did for a hobby for myself, you know, in the beginning. He understands musicians. He understands the excitement of instruments, how they add new blood kind of to what a musician is doing. And they're inspiring. Like you said, they come with songs sort of built into them. Just like an amazing uncle that I never knew I had. I don't think I've ever had better company service or support. From, from anything. He emails me all the time, just checking in or checking up or, or giving me news. We've had that correspondence for 20 years. I have a very dear relationship with him. He just became very personable right away from the first day that I reached out. I didn't realize he was an oral surgeon. You know how doctors kind of have their hobbies, like some do golf or sailing or they're pilots. Matt's was like, I'm gonna design guitars. I just put him up there in the category of some of the most awesome people I know. It's completely unique. We'd have conversations on broad subjects. They were always fascinating. He has incredible insight on things. I don't think I've ever met a nicer person. He's just genuinely a really nice guy. He's like a very nice, dedicated guy. Serious about guitars, but not, thank God, too serious. That's good. We love you. You've been an inspiration my whole life. And, uh, you know, I love you. We could ask for a better friend, a better just life friend, because we've been there since we were young, before we high school, all the way to now, and especially now, I really appreciate how important it was, our friendship, our love we've had over the years. Music Box, we love you. Yes. Uh, Momo, we love you too, man. Before Music Box, my relationship with guitars or any instrument really was completely invisible. Like I had no idea. I would buy something from Guitar Center and it was this giant corporation. There was no connection between the instrument, me, and the company. And it all changed when I got a Music Box and I realized there's a human being on the other side of this guitar and actually cares about the people that play his instruments. All of a sudden, I started actually caring about it. I put it down more carefully. You know, I would use it a lot more. I was very conscious and aware of when I have a project like uh, the SG. No, let's get the music box in this because it's kind of cool that this Disney cartoon has a music box in it. He is so happy to be here that I'm going to do whatever in my power to have him in this business because I need more people like him in this business. He's a bit of a unicorn. He's got such an enthusiasm and passion for what he does. And Matt is just passionate as it gets. He's really behind everything. He wants to know what I think. He's really involved. I mean, as involved as it gets. I'm one of those that I am so connected to the spirit of Matt Eichen. I'm more of a fan of him than just his guitars. The guy is a legend. He's got the vision. He's one of the funniest guys I've ever met. I think he's just one of the sweetest guys in the industry. I love how passionate he is about what he's doing, and uh, I think this, this speaks volumes about him and much more than, than I can say here. Just look at his uh, products and uh, at his company, and this will tell you so much about what kind of guy he is. He's just a geek. I have a huge heart for, for people who go different ways and to, to figure out their own thing and just go for it. And uh, what he's doing is really cool, and I love to uh, work with him. I'm actually must say in, in the late 90s and we've kept in touch since. I went to see him at one of the shows when we sat down in the corner and something about him, you know, he just, just gets you through. There is a presence and when he walks, he doesn't go, I think he glides, he's like he's on a skateboard. There goes Matt. <laughs> While we are here, this is the end of the movie. I want to thank you guys for tripping up with me on this. My friend Matt has been a labor of love and respect that has taken several years to complete. 
And I really want to thank all the amazing people who have taken part in this. I've learned because of you guys even more about my friend Matt, as well as gotten to become friends and having met all these amazing people he's been telling me about all these years. So cool. I desperately wanted to quit the music business and being reignited by a dentist from New Jersey came with so much more than just being hooked up with a nice guy that ran an instrument company. It made me wanna play, create for him and his energy personally. And out of respect that I wanted to give back to the individual that had not only changed my life musically, but who recognized, appreciated, and encouraged my personal values and thoughts like only a true friend, brother, or loving parent would. I also recognize that there is a, a certain kind of person that gets attracted to the Matt style creation. Just how much we all actually have in common. Like there's a little bit of Matt that comes with every single music box and it's kind of built in there like his principles or something like that. I know it sounds a bit strange, but it, it, it's actually true. Uh, as you can see from speaking to all these people in this movie, there's this thing that joins that we all have in common, you know? And I gotta say, man, that really is a very musical and human thing to be able to combine into one situation. Again, I wanna thank all the beautiful people who took part in my friend Matt. And to Matt and his family, I love you guys. You guys are beautiful, beautiful people, man. Matt, love you, brother. I certainly think the world of him, uh, both as, as a businessman and a musician and a fan of instruments. He's done a fantastic job with his company. I, the music business needs more Dr. Matt Eikens in it. Just a great guy. I started looking for some mainstream that is cool looking at. Then I found your videos, started to listen. Since then I have played only this bass and I used it to string stuff. It was like becoming the part of a family. You have done more than anyone could have asked for, and you even done things that I haven't asked for. <laughs> it's something I hear from everybody who has any business with him. Not a lot of people like him around, I can tell you that. You want to say something to my friend Matt? <laughs> <laughs> to my dad, thank you for being a part of this with me. Um, I have learned so much, whether it was from the way you look at things, your personality, your perspective. Business-wise, I definitely have grown a lot as a person from the time I was 16 until now, I'm 26 years old. Um, and I definitely cherish all those memories of all the times that we had spent together working on everything. And I, I look forward to continuing this with you into the future. Thank you for all that you have taught me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't cry, Momo. <laughs>